Problem solving looks for the best thing to do in the current circumstances. It looks for an optimal solution. It's quantitative versus qualitative, experimental versus experiential, and it's research-based. And we leave students with the impression the best thing you can do with the problem is solve it. And that's absolutely false. Because of a number of reasons. One is that no problem ever stays solved. But more importantly, every solution creates new problems. You see, every problem in science that was formulated by Galileo has long since been solved, but science hasn't disappeared. Because every time we solve a problem, we create a new one, and a new one is harder than the old one. The progress of science depends as much on a generation of new problems as it does on a generation of old solutions. We don't teach people that. But the important thing is there's something you do to a problem that's better than solving it. And that's dissolving it. How in the world do you dissolve a problem? By redesigning the system that has it so that the problem no longer exists. There's a marvelous story, probably apocryphal, but I like to believe it's true, of a young man who went to the Ohio Match Company many years ago with a proposal. Some of you are old enough to remember the paper books of matches, which used to be given out every time you bought a package of cigarettes. And there was a problem with those matches, because if you left the cover open and struck a match on the abrasive on the front, sometimes a spark would fly from the match and ignite the matches in the book, and people would burn their hands. And the Ohio Match Company used to receive at least a thousand suits a year from people who had burnt their hands. Well, they got enough sense and printed on the bottom of the matchbox a little statement said, please close the cover before striking. You may remember that. It turned out this didn't do two things. First, it didn't reduce their legal liability for burnt hands. And secondly, it didn't stop most people from striking matches with the book open. Now, this young man came in. He said, suppose I could tell you how to make a paper book of matches in a way that people cannot possibly burn their hands. And it will cost you no more to make that book of matches than it does to make the current one. How much is it worth to you? He said, you tell us what the answer is and we'll tell you how much it's worth. He said, oh no. You tell me how much it's worth and I'll tell you the answer. Well, they wound up hiring lawyers who negotiated a contract and when the contract was finally negotiated, it involved actually $42,000, according to the story. The contract was signed by both men. He turned to the young man and said, what are you, what's your proposal? He said, take the abrasive and put it on the back of the matchbook cover. And everyone subsequently was done that way. See, he didn't solve the problem. He dissolved it. He redesigned the matchbook cover so the problem no longer existed. Disillusion involves design. Solution involves research. We don't recognize design as a way of dealing with problems that's superior even to research. And we don't teach design because we don't know it and don't understand it. Some of us, like me, was lucky enough to be trained in architecture where I learned it without knowing what I was learning. The architect, as a profession, is the only one I know of who really understands a system. He's unconscious of his understanding that may be why he understands it. He doesn't know what he's doing. But he does it right. See, a family comes in to see an architect, and they say, we want to build a home. And what we want is a house with three bedrooms, a living room, dining room, and kitchen connected to each other. We want a family room where the kids can play. We want a two-car garage. We want it all on one floor. We'd like it to be whatever it is, colonial or modern architecture. We'd like it to cost under whatever it is, $100,000. Architect says, fine, let me think about it, make some sketches. You come back in a week and we'll talk about it. Now, what does the architect do? Does he make a list of the rooms they want and then produce a design of each room and then say, how do I put these together into a house? Is that what he does? Of course not. What he does is produce a sketch of the house, the whole. And now he begins to put rooms in it. He divides the space of the house up into rooms. Then he looks at it and he says, well, these bedrooms are a little too small and they're the wrong shape. They're a little too long for their width. So I ought to make them a little wider, but that means changing the house. 
Should I change the house? Only if changing the house to accommodate the room makes the house better. A part is never modified unless it makes the whole better. That's the systemic principle. You don't change the part because it makes the part better without considering its impact on the whole. That's systemic thinking.